would t- uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter here tonight. We'll be looking at a few things in God's Word. It is good to have Megan's family here tonight with us. They, um, they did come to hear me preach. Now, what they probably didn't understand, they didn't know, is it not on? It's not. Is that good? Okay. So what, so what Megan's family pro- probably did not know is that you can actually look uh, my sermon's up online at the church website, and then that way you can turn it off when you don't like what you hear. So now you're kind of stuck. You're going to have to stick it out to the very end, and uh, that might not be good for you. But I'm excited, glad that they're here to be with us here tonight, and uh, we're going to look into God's Word here in First Peter chapter number 1. Uh, and the sermon I'm entitled, It's Time to Work. It's Time to Work. Now, sometimes when, when, you're, when I'm studying, trying to figure out what the Lord have for me to preach, a lot of times... Um, I'll get caught in kind of a, a, a rhythm or a mode where I just see the Scripture and I just see the Scripture in one specific way. And, and just the way that the Lord kind of works and uses my brain to kind of pick apart different Scriptures. And a lot of times I'll see this different Scriptures and, and I'll, I'll see them and, and I'll come to the same conclusion because the Scripture is full of, of the same thing a lot of times and it's all about the glory of God and, and the work of the Lord. And so whenever I study, sometimes I can get caught preaching different passages and ended up preaching the same sermon. And and, and in one of these instances, we've been going through the book of 1 Peter with the the youth on Wednesday night, and so I was really trying to dig in and find something uh, maybe a little bit different, maybe beneath the surface in some of the study that that we were looking at here. And and in doing so, I I found this passage of Scripture, and we've been looking through this. And if you were to just first glance look at the the book of 1 Peter, and especially the chapter 1, you would not think this is a, a, a passage of Scripture that's just encouraging uh, commanding, wanting people to just get to work. But in, in looking at this, I, I realized that there were some very interesting uh, kind of hints. And, and if you look below the surface, you can really see that this really is a call for Christians to get to work. All right, so we're going to look at this. And, and, and in order to do this, we're going to look in, in verses 13. Uh, and we're going to look verses 13 and, and down a little bit. But before we get into verse 13, it's just kind of a background of what's going on here. In verses 1 through 13... Uh, The Bible really paints this picture to Christians of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It paints the picture that, hey, Jesus Christ came, he he lived his earthly life, did a work on uh, on this earth, Uh, his ministry was over, he he died, was buried, and then rose again. And, And because of this resurrection in Jesus Christ, now Christians everywhere can have a hope in Jesus Christ, and they can have a promise that Jesus Christ was going to come again and come to set up his earthly kingdom and his rule and reign on the earth. And we see this, that, that, that Peter is talking to Christians here, and when he's saying this, uh, he's, he's almost telling them as, as a warning, hey, you have this great hope, you have this great promise in Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean you can just stop and just, just spend your time just waiting on this promise of the Lord to be fulfilled. And he says that we know that this promise is going to be fulfilled, we know that we have a hope in Jesus Christ, but that by no means means that you can just sit down and just wait for the Lord to come. And we see that that is something that can be so easily done in the churches today. We can see that in churches today, it can be very easy to become complacent. It can become very easy to just look up into the clouds waiting for the Lord to return. It can become very easy uh, to, just, to just dwell on the, the past and, and the glory days of, uh, that are behind us and just say, okay, we've done our job, uh, now let's just wait for the Lord uh, to, to return. And we get into like a spiritual retirement mode where we say, hey, I'm done, the Lord's going to come back, His promise is going to be fulfilled, and we're going to spend an eternity with Him in heaven. But what we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and down is a call to not just stay and be complacent and to get into the spiritual retirement, as it were, but then to, to get to work. To not just stand looking at the clouds, uh, but to to put our hands and our feet to work for the the kingdom of God. And so we're going to look at here tonight, it's time to get to work. So we're going to look at a few things that we see in this passage of Scripture. And before we get into the passage of Scripture and we read what we're going to be studying here tonight, I just want to open up in a word of prayer. So if you would pray with me here tonight. Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity once again to come into your house to worship you. Uh, Lord, to come into your house to to study your word, to grow closer to you, an opportunity for us to take this truth from Scripture and apply it to our own lives. God, I do ask that you please give me the words to say. Use me as a vessel that would only uh, only give the words that you would have. Uh, Lord, that you would speak to my heart just as much as you would speak to anyone else's heart here tonight, God. And ultimately, uh, my goal here tonight is to lift your name up, to glorify your name and honor your name, Lord. And that's what I ask that would be done here 
as we study, Lord, that, that no praise would come to me, but all praise and glory would go to you, for you are truly worthy, you're truly deserving of any praise, God. So we ask that you please be with us tonight, and we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, we're going to read here. Uh, we're just going to read all the way down to 21 uh, to start off with, and then we'll probably uh, pinpoint some different verses as we, as we look into it. All right, verse 13 says this, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning, sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from, the, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we see here it's time to get the work. And the first thing we see here uh, before we ever uh, get into the work is we must first prepare for the work. The first thing we have to do is, is if we're going to go out and do the Lord's work is we have to prepare for the work. And the Bible says, says something that's a little interesting, something we wouldn't necessarily know in today's vernacular. In verse 13 it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up your loins. That's kind of an in interesting phrase that the Scripture uses. It uses several times uh, throughout Scripture. And, and it's kind of interesting. We don't usually think of this, gird up your loins. But, but the reality is, when the Bible says, gird up your loins, of course, in, in Bible times, they, they didn't dress exactly the same as we did here today. They, the men wouldn't wear uh, you know, suit and, suit and tie. They wouldn't wear... Uh, jeans or, or a shirt, anything like that, they would, all, they would wear a, a long flowing, almost like a robe, like a, like a tunic. They would wear a, almost like a dress. And so I'm glad we, I don't live in Bible times because I, I don't want to wear a dress as a man. But they did. They wore, they wore a long robe. It was able, they were in the desert. It was very hot. So that was able for them to, to stay cool and, and they would cover their bodies so they wouldn't get burnt by the sun. And so what they would do is whenever it became time to do a strenuous activity, whenever it became time to do some work, that the, what they would do because the, 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 dress, as it were, was constricting on their motion. They couldn't move way that they would like to. They would roll up this, this garment and they would wrap it around their legs so then they could move about freely. Now I have a picture up here. I'm a visual learner. Uh, well, I say I'm a visual learner. That's, anybody that says they're a visual learner, that pretty much just means they're not really a good learner. And so they use an excuse by, by having a picture. So I have a picture. I don't know if you can see this, but this is, a, this is a diagram of how to gird up your loins. So if anybody is in a situation where they're, they're using a, a robe here and they need to quickly gird up their loins, uh, this is what, what, it, what you would need to do. Okay? You see, you start off with what, what would be called uh, the robe-type dress there. And you would lift it up above your knees, you'd tie it around, wrap it around almost like a big diaper, so that then you could now uh, move around freely, you could do, the, to do the, what you would need to do. So, girding up your loins. Essentially, I say all that to say this, pretty much what the Bible is saying here is it's time to roll up your sleeves. It's time to get prepared for the work of the Lord. We have to prepare for the work of the Lord. we got to uh, make sure we're dressed for the right occasion. We're not dressed to go to a wedding. We're not dressed to go uh, to church. We're dressed to go to work. And, and the Bible says that we are to gird up the loins of your mind. And the interesting thing here is, is, is we, we see that the Bible says to gird up the, lo the loins of your mind. Because it always, anytime you're going to work, it always starts in your mind. As a Christian, your mind is one of the most valuable and precious things that you can guard against. You have to gird up the loins of your mind. Before you ever get to work, before you ever do the work of the Lord, you have to make sure that, first off, your mind is in the right place. Your mind needs to be guarded. It needs to be prepared for the work of the Lord. So first, when we're preparing for the work of the Lord, we must gird up our loins. But then nextly, we have to be, to be sober. To be sober. Now, the Bible uses this, this word several times in Scripture. And, and actually, in, in, first, uh, in the book of First or Second Peter 1... The Bible says that we need to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So this term sober means to be watchful, to be of a sound 
mind. Of course, we're all familiar uh, with, with uh, what would be considered someone who drinks alcohol or, or becomes drunk. And when they're not drunk or when they are drunk and they want to get of a clear mind and a sound mind, then we would say they would need to sober up. And this is essentially what the Bible is saying here. It's saying you need to be sober. You need to be of a clear mind. You need to be able to watch and be vigilant to make sure that, that your mind is in the, in the place it's, it's supposed to be. Because again, if your mind is not where it needs to be, then you will never be able to do the work of the Lord. So the Bible says that we need to be sober. We need to be watchful of a sound mind. There should be nothing that comes in between uh, us and, and doing the work of the Lord. There should be nothing that, that our mind is preoccupied with. It should be 100%, 100% solely involved in the work of the Lord. We must be sober. The next thing we see when we prepare for the work of the Lord is we are to hope. We are to hope. The Bible says this uh, in verse, uh, verse 13. We see that we are to gird up, gird up the loins of our mind to be sober. And then it says to hope, uh, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the hope and the promise that Jesus Christ had given to us. And, and hope is one of the most powerful agents that anybody can experience. If you have hope in your life, you can press on through some of the most difficult and trying times of your life. So essentially what the Bible is saying here, what, what Peter is telling to Christians everywhere is this. Hey, this work that you're about to do, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. And in those hard times, when you're, when you're tired and you're weak and you don't think you can go on, it's saying, hey, you have something that you're fighting for. You can hope because you know that the promise that Jesus Christ has given to us will come true. We can hope for the return of Jesus Christ. Hope is a very powerful thing. There was a study done at a college, I believe it was John Hopkins University, and they wanted to see how long a rat could swim in water. How long a rat could swim in water. So um, in colleges, they're doing very important studies. You know, they're, they're not trying to cure diseases or anything like that. They're trying to figure out how long rats can swim in water because that's important. We all need to know how long rats can swim in water, okay? So anyways, they were doing this study, and they, they dropped the rat into a swimming pool. And the, lat, the rat was swimming around. And he, he was looking. There's no way for him to get out. So he was swimming as hard as he could until eventually the rat would drown. And it took about 10 minutes and the rat would drown. But when, when he added the element of hope to this rat, it, it was, if, if the person uh, that was doing the research would lift the rat out of the water for, for nothing more than, than one second, just lift him up, put him right back in, that it was, the, the result was, was astronomical. The rat could then swim an extra 60 hours. It was unbelievable. If, if the researcher would just lift the rat out of the water every 10 minutes, one, one time every 10 minutes. So he gets to about 10 minutes. The rat is just about to swim. He's about to swim his last, his last paddle. His breath was, was going to be overtaken. If he just lifted it out of the water and put him right back in, he could swim. And in doing that, just the, the element of hope was able to, to drive this, this rat to be able to swim for, for multitudes of, of time to add on to his life. So we see that this, this idea of hope is very powerful even in our own life. And Peter is saying, hey, the difficult times are going to come. They're going to come where, where you're not going to want to push forward. You're not going to want to do anything extra. You're not, you're not going to want to do anything more. You want to, to lay down your hammer and just give up. But the Bible says, hey, you don't have to give up because you have the hope. You have the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to allow you to give that extra breath of life, to get that second wind because we have the hope of the Lord. The next thing we see here in preparing for the work is we must remove the former life. Remove the former life. In verse 14, it says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. We see that we must remove this former life. We have to get rid of the things and the past sins and, and those past things that, would, that before would, would slow us down. They, they, would, they would get in between us and the Lord, get in between us and the work. The Bible uses this, 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 this term here, uh, remove yourselves from the uh, former lust in your ignorance. You see, before we were saved, before we were uh, brought into the newness of life, we were ignorant. Uh, I, I remember one time, uh, my, my, my father, who's a preacher, he was preaching a sermon. And, and he was talking about, he was in line at, at like a, a fast food restaurant, like a Wendy's or something like that. And, and he was in line, and, and this person came up behind him, and he was just, he was just acting, acting a fool. I mean, he was, he was acting crazy. I mean, he was dressed all uh, crazy, and he, he was using foul language. And, and, and the person that was with, with my dad, he was saying, man, this is crazy. What's this guy thinking? I can't believe he's acting like that. 
And, and my dad looked at him. He said, you know what? Yeah, he's acting probably a little inappropriate, but the reality is I, I understand why he's acting like that. Because he's lost. See, we don't expect a lost person to act like they're a saved person. We don't expect that because they're ignorant. They don't know about the newness of life. They don't know how they're supposed to walk in, in the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be evident in their life because they're lost. They haven't experienced the new life in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. But if you're not in Christ, you're not a new creature. You're an old creature. You're ignorant. You don't know any better. But when you have become a Christian, you've accepted uh, Jesus Christ into your life, then we expect you to live a little bit differently. We don't expect you to act in your ignorance because you're no longer ignorant. We, we expect a, a, an adult to act a little bit different than a child. We expect an adult to be able to, to eat and feed himself because he knows better. He's been trained. He's been taught. And so for an adult to act like a child, we say, is, is pathetic. It's wrong. It's terrible. It, it's, it's embarrassing. And, and what Peter is saying here is if you're going to do the work of the Lord, then you have to get rid of the, the old life. All this stuff that you did when you were ignorant and, and lost and not saved, you need to put it aside. You need to mature. You need to grow up because you're, you're about to do this work for the Lord that is important. It's going to be difficult. And so you can't, be, you can't be ignorant. You can't be living this life in your ignorance. Before you had an excuse, but now there is no excuse. You know how to live. You know how to, how to work. You know how to do the work of the Lord here. So, so get rid of the old life. But then another thing we see here in getting rid of the old life, now we must be holy. Be holy. The Bible says in verse 15, But he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We must be holy. Now this is important when we see here this, this idea of all manner of conversation. We think of conversation, a lot of times we think of, of our communicate, how we speak, how we speak to one another. And that's important. But what the Bible says here is all manner of conversation. It's what it means here is that we and how we live our life. You, you know, they, they say that, that the, way you, the way you act speaks louder than the way you, do, the way you talk. People see uh, us, and they see us, and we, they should see that we are Christians because of the way we act. But also in the way we speak, in the way we dress, in the way we, the way we communicate, in how we are driving down the road, how we're, how we're walking through the mall, how we're, how we're eating at a restaurant, how we're treating our waitresses. Hey, how are your manners? Are you polite? Are you rude? Uh, it's all important because all manner of conversation, we need to be holy. We need to make sure that when people see us, there's no doubt in their mind, hey, they're a Christian. They've got, some, they've got the Lord in their life. And it goes back to the idea of, okay, you're not ignorant anymore. There's no more excuses. You know that you must be mature. You're growing in the Lord. Are you perfect? Of course not. No one is perfect. No one is expecting you to be perfect. But you should be holy. You should strive to be holy. You should strive to be growing in every aspect of your life. You should be holy. So we see that before we, we get into the work, we must first prepare for the work. We should gird up the loins of our minds. We should be sober. We should continually hope of that promise of Jesus Christ. We should get rid of the former life and the former lust in the flesh. And then we should now be holy in Jesus Christ. So the next thing we see here when we're, when we're doing the work is that we don't work alone. See, sometimes as Christians, we can get into this mindset that, that God has called me to do something, and he hasn't called anybody else, and so I'm going to do it all by myself. You know, I don't need any help. God's called me to do this work, so he wouldn't have called me if he didn't think I could do it by myself. But the Bible teaches us that we are not supposed to work alone. The Bible says in verse 17, And if ye call on the Father, if you call on the Father, this idea of the father is the idea of, of a parent. And I, I was fortunate enough to have uh, good godly parents. And, and I was fortunate enough to have parents that, that provided for me. And, I, and hopefully everyone in here was able to do that. Of course, I know in the world we live in today, not everyone is, is blessed enough to have parents that would provide for them. But if we think of the idea of a parent providing for their child, we think that that's a natural thing that they do. They naturally want to provide. They naturally want to be there for their child. And when the child says, hey, I need this, or, or I, I need you at this point, that the parent's going to be the first one they are running to help their child. So we think of a parent loving their child. How much more is our Heavenly Father going to love us? And, and the Scripture talks about that, how, how if, a, if, if a child would say, you know, Dad, I'm hungry, that you would give them a serpent and say, hey, here you go, something that's, that's deadly and dangerous, and you say, hey, here you go, you can eat this. 
when it's, it's deadly, it's poisonous, it's not something that's going to be beneficial to us. It, no, that's something we wouldn't do. But how much more would a father on this earth provide for their child? Would our heavenly father provide for us? The father who, who clothes the flowers, who, who protects the birds in the sky, how much more would he protect us who are made in his own image? And yet so oftentimes we think, I'm going to do the work of the Lord on my own. First of all, it's the work of the Lord. So if we're not, use, we're not using the Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we're doing His work, then, then we're not being very smart in how we're acting here. But if we're doing the work of the Lord, we don't have to do it alone. We don't need to do it alone, and, and we don't have to. And of course, God is there with us. He is our Father. He will help us. And, and how much more can we have the greatest help of anything on earth? We have the help of the person who created the work, created the world, created everything in this world. And so we can call upon our Heavenly Father and we can say, hey, Lord, I need your help. And he'll be right there ready to help us. We don't have to work alone. But then thirdly, we see this. We know why we work. Know why you're working. You know, it can become easy uh, to just go to church and you say, the preacher gets up and says, you know, you need to go to, pre- you need to, go to work. You need to go to work. You need to go to work. You need to go to spiritual. You need to do everything you need to be to, to be uh, spiritually ready to go to work, to go to work, to go to work. And we think, man, that's awesome. But why am I doing this work? Right? I, I can remember growing up, my, my dad, again, I, I talked about how he was a, a good dad. Of course, I might have to send this, this message to him for Father's Day because I'm just really bragging on him tonight. But I, I talked about how he was a good dad. He, he provided for me. Well, one of the ways he was a really good dad was that he made me work growing up. My dad, he was not a, a afraid to uh, work his child to death. He wasn't, he wasn't scared of child labor laws, you know, that kind of thing. My dad, he, he put, put me and my brothers and my sister, he put us to work. And so I, every time I'd come home from college, and of course, uh, you come home from college, you, know, you get done working, and if you're, if you're like me in college, here's what you do. You go through the semester, you get to the end of the semester, and you haven't done any of the work that you had all semester to do. So you got like five pages or five papers that are ten pages apiece that you have to do at the end of the semester. So the last week, and in, it's in the finals, you were just, just busy. And you're staying up all night. You're, you're just cramming everything you can do. I remember last, uh, last a couple semesters ago, I had like three or four papers to do. And, uh, and I just put them off because I'm, I'm not very bright, obviously. And so I just put off these papers. And so I just had to work like all night. So I had a buddy of mine, and we just we, we got into my room, and we set up this, this couch, and I had like three computer screens going, and I was just typing away and getting everything to go together, and my, my bed was just covered in books because I'm writing this paper. And then on top of that, I've got to, I've got to prepare uh, for the final that I have to take the next day that covers the entire material, and it's just, just not good because that's, that's what you're supposed to do in college, right? Uh, no, that's not what you're supposed to do, college-age students. Don't do that. Learn from my mistakes, not your own. Uh, but anyway, so... So I'm crammed up. So I finally make it home, okay? I finally am somehow, by the miraculous work of the Lord, able to pass all my grades. And so I make it home. And so I'm home, and the first thing I do when I get home is I find the recliner, I prop down in it, recline that bad bear, and I just lay back, and I just, okay, all right, now I can finally rest. And one thing that my dad would always do, and and some things it's not what he asked me to do, but it's like the way he words it. And, and, and he, I, 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 sometimes I think he might be a little bit sadistic in his mind when he, when he wants people to work because he would always come up to me like, hey, how's it going? You know, all happy, you know, good to see you, glad you're home, and all this kind of things. And so, so I'm looking and I'm just waiting, you know, hey, Dad, how's it going? He says, guess what? And I immediately, as soon as he says, guess what, I immediately want to, want to pack up my things and go back to school because I know whatever he's about to say to me is going to be a lot worse than any schoolwork that I could possibly do. But this is what he would say. He'd say, hey, guess what? And he's smiling and I'm like, what, Dad? And he says, I got a couple projects for you while you're down. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? I just got home. I, you know, I haven't even had any sleep. I'm going on like two hours of sleep for this past week, and you've got some projects for me. Great. That's awesome. And these projects are not, you know, I need you to help me eat all the stuff that's in the fridge. You know, this is, I need you to go cut the grass. I need you to rake the leaves. I need you to pick up the pine cones that are in the yard with your bare hands. And, and it's just not fun. But one of the reasons that why these projects that my dad would, would make me do, one of the reasons why they weren't any fun was because I knew that I was not going to get anything out of the work. I knew that whenever I worked for my dad, I wasn't getting paid. And, of course, you know, it's always the, the typical father line, well, I'm providing a roof over your head, and, and I'm providing food for your, for your stomach, and, and I'm providing more food for your stomach. And, you know, I get all that. But whenever I do work for other people, I get paid. But whenever I work for my dad, I didn't get paid. And so whenever my dad said, hey, 
I want you to do this project. It was always just so just, just terrible. It was, it was like, you know, just, just one of the worst feelings in the world. I'm not even going to get paid. I'm not getting anything out of this project for my dad. But whenever I'd, I would work for uh, my boss, he would pay me. And so I know that whenever I'm working, I can work a little bit harder because I know at the end of this job, I'm going to get a paycheck. And with that paycheck, then I, could, I can have money to, to do things and I can do things that I want to do because I'm working towards something. I know why I'm working. And in our Christian life, I think it can become easy to just go through the motions of doing the work of the Lord, going to church, helping out around the church, sharing the gospel, sharing our faith. And we think, man, this is such a, just such a drudgery because I don't know why I'm, I'm working. And we think, you know, God, why am I doing this? Why are you asking me to do these little projects for you? But the reality is the Bible teaches us that there is a reason why we're doing the work. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, we see the reason why we are working. We see the reward for working and why we get to, get to the work and, and roll up our sleeves and go to work. Verse 18 says this, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Hey, why, why are you doing the work for the Lord? Why, when, when God asks you to do, why is it not a drudgery and something that you just hate to hear? Why? Because we are redeemed. We are redeemed. We have been, we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we talked about that hope and that promise of the Lord. And one of the things we say, maybe we come, become complacent, we just look up to the clouds and say, I'm not going to do any work because the Lord's coming back. The reality is because he has bought us, because we have the hope, because we have the promise of the Lord, that is why we should be working. That's why we are in the, in the, the trenches and, and doing the things that are, that are maybe dirty and some of the things that we wouldn't necessarily like to do because God has given us a promise and he has redeemed us. Our, our price has been paid. But not only has our price been paid by something that's just temporary or something that will fade away into the, into the dust, but it's been paid by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's not been paid by silver. It's not been paid by gold or by precious things. It's not been paid by money. It's not been bought by things of this world, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He was the spotless lamb. He was our atonement. The only way that we could possibly be redeemed was through Jesus Christ. It's a one in a million shot, and Jesus Christ was that one, and he was able to come. He came, he chose willingly to come to this earth to redeem us so that our price has been paid, and now we can go to work. Now we can go to work. Now we have the privilege to go to work. So we know why we're working. We don't have to be just, just bogged down with this, this, oh man, I'm just not, why am I doing this? What? We know why we're doing it, because Christ has redeemed us, because we have a promise in the Lord Jesus Christ that once we die, once the Lord comes back, that we will have an eternal kingdom set up that we can be a part of, that we can have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we work. That is why we work. So the three things we see here is that first we have to prepare for our work. We can't just jump in if we're not trained. We've got to have the proper tools. We've got to be properly prepared for the work. We realize that we don't have to work alone. We're not doing this by ourselves. We have the, the almighty hand of the Father coming down to help us and to aid us in our work. And we have a purpose. We know why we are working. So the only thing left to do then is get to work. The only thing left for us to do is get to work. We know why we're working. We know how to work. We know what we need to do to work. So now all that's left is to work. We need to get busy doing the work of the Lord. And you say, what is the work of the Lord? Well, the work of the Lord are, are, are a few things. Number one, it's, it's people everywhere that are lost and dying in this world. It's, that's the work of the Lord. The Bible said in the Great Commission, Jesus Christ himself said, Go ye therefore, teach, preach, baptize, okay, convert the lost masses around the world. Talk to those people at your work. Talk to the people at your school. Talk to those that are around you, your neighbor who, who doesn't know about the love of Jesus Christ. Get out to them. The people all around us that are lost and dying and are going to spend an eternity in hell, get out doing the work, doing the work, witnessing, preaching to them, living your life as an example to them. But then also the work of the Lord is the church of the Lord. 
This church that we, we call home, the church that, that we love so much, the church that in the glory days was, was unbelievable. Now we're no longer in the glory days, and we're no longer trying to become complacent just looking at the clouds. Now we're doing the work of this church. We're going out. Again, talking to people, saying, hey, do you know about Belvoir Church? Hey, do you go to church anywhere? We're knocking on the door saying, hey, do you go to church anywhere? We're inviting people to come to VBS. We're getting the, the little kids to come in, our grandkids, our family, saying, hey, come experience this church that has been such a blessing to our lives. Come and, and be a part of this. Hey, we're doing the work of the Lord. We're, it's, all, it's all part of the work of the Lord. And so now we have to get busy doing the work of the Lord. We have to get busy doing the work of the Lord. Of the Lord. It's time to get to work. So are you working here tonight? Are you, are you doing your work for the Lord? Are, are you doing uh, the work that Jesus Christ has called you to do? You know what you have to do. You have to prepare. You have to gird up the loins of your, your mind. You have to roll up your sleeve. You have to be watching, be vigilant, be sober. You, you have to realize that I'm not doing this by myself. This is not a, a lone gun operation. We've got the, the backing of the Holy Spirit, the, the God of the universe is backing us, and we have a purpose. We know why we work. The precious, redeeming blood that Jesus Christ gave to us has been made available to everyone. And so that is why we are doing the work of the Lord. And so tonight at Belvoir, in Greenville, North Carolina, Pitt County, North Carolina, it's time for us to get to work.